Welcome to week two as we look at theory and method in social science. I hope last week you had a sense to um, be able to get to know the class, how to use Canvas. Um, once again, look at the video that uh, I have uploaded or that has been uploaded uh, going through the syllabus a little bit. Um, but I am excited to see week two come around. Hopefully all your classes are going well. We, uh, as social scientists, um, have to recognize that to be valid in the scientific community, we have to have ways in which we measure. And social science and other relation to other sciences sometimes uh, gets called a soft science. Um, because of how we do our empirical work, we're working with subjects that can change their mind, can choose to um, not reveal the truth, and may act out of um, certain reactions that they typically might not. And so there's a lot of times psychology, social science, social psychology, uh, even economics is sometimes called the soft science. However, one thing we've noticed, it is a new science as well. It mostly was originated out of the response to the growth of capitalism and the industrial revolution out of Western Europe and the different uh, social scientists, as we've talked about, Marx, Durkheim, Max Weber, W.E. Du Bois, um, and uh, Margaret Landau. She, th these are all people that have um, done a lot to get that whole idea of studying people, tracking what they do, and what we call that when we're tracking people and what they're doing is a social fact. If we see it happen enough to where that social uh, problem is presenting itself not just as personal problems or problems that only affect a few, but tend to start becoming things that people do in patterns. Those are what we call social facts. And that comes from Durkheim when he did his study on suicide in Western Europe and the response to uh, the Industrial Revolution and especially with men in that era who took their life because that change was um, making such a big impact on the norms of their life that they couldn't take that change. And so they found a sense of not belonging in anime. And in that, there was a rise over a particular time, even though economically things were starting to boom in communities, it was the actual processes and changing those processes that Durkheim was able to connect with. He also connected that with religion, meaning that Protestants and Catholics acted differently about suicide um, and seemed to uh, see that Protestants had a higher level of suicide uh, because of their individual belief uh, about salvation rather than Catholicism having um, sanctions and how it would affect the family. So there are things like that that we have studied over time and as we do that, we also have a research process. Like any other science, we have an eight-step method. This is when you're looking at your own presentation, I want you to keep this in mind, that as you're talking about a social problem and how to investigate that, that these eight steps are part of what you use. I will be looking for this um, because we can't just say, oh, I wanna study something and not you know, put some parameters around it. So it's important to look at this process um, with, with a, a sense of method and trying to see, you know, it doesn't have to be difficult, but it does have to be something that I can clearly see when you're looking at that social problem. So let's look at these. When you define the problem, you're basically saying something like, um, okay, student debt. We all know that that exists, right? It has, however, increased to such a large number that it is starting to create a social impact on marriage, um, whether or not people are able to own homes or choose to own homes. It's redefining what it means to become established because people are not buying into the old dreams of the 50s and the 60s of this pattern. And a lot of people will say, that you can see some correlation between how much it costs for us to gain our education and then in return be able to try to pay off that debt and some of those other processes are affected by that. So that might be the problem. Does student uh, debt affect, and then you can fill in the blank, does student debt 
affect uh, the marriage rate? Does it affect the housing rate? Um, as far as people feeling like they're in debt, um, is it increasing um, over time? That's just an example, but that's what defining a problem is. It's not just saying, I wanna look at student debt. It's like, what is causing and what is one of the, or what may be one of the causes. Um, so that's, that's defining the pro problem. Then let's say with that same example, you start to review the literature, go to the library, use your library uh, link and go online. The Emporia Library or the ESU Library has all kinds of articles if you would type in student debt and uh, marriage um, rate. You would probably find all kinds of articles and different kinds of um, journal entries based on that process. It could be in education, it could be in uh, economics. I'm wanting you to look specifically, specifically at social science. However, if you do find something that's in a peer reviewed article or some sort of literature based on that uh, in another field, that's fine as long as it's not something that is, um, you know, just CNN did some sort of a special article on it. Um, now, if CNN used some sort of reference to another uh, study, that, that could be used. But you review that literature and you see, hey, is this being seen by other people? What are they saying? And it helps fill in some of the statistics and the data. From that, then you formulate your hypothesis. For example, you could look at Emporia State and the level of student debt as it affects, and it could be certain things, it could be effect um, on students uh, participate dating, you know, do students with higher debt date even? Do they even think about it? <laughs> um, people don't date as much as they used to and we're seeing that go down in college, especially because a lot of people don't feel like they can commit to a long-term relationship while they're also com committing to their uh, form of how they'll, they'll uh, see themselves in a, in a job or um, whatever career they're looking for. And so that might be your hypothesis. Uh, people are dating less as they acquire more student debt. That might be something to check out. Then select a research design. That means you're going to do some things like a survey or some sort of online thing, or you can observe uh, data that has been turned in. Sometimes it's hard to get that when it's something so personal as student debt, but you might be able to go on to uh, US Census or something that might have that uh, sense of debt and, and then uh, do a, a correlation with that. I can help you with that research design. Sometimes the easiest one is just to take a survey and see what the answers are. Then you carry out that research and um, it's important using this example um, to recognize that, you know, if you do a research of uh, students on the Emporia State campus, um, 10 people is a certain kind of research, but 100 people is gonna give you a much more deep uh, understanding. And I know that you're not gonna be able to interview thousands of students, but I would put a strong emphasis on at least uh, having a research design that, that interviewed as many people or studied as many people as possible. Then you interpret your results based on the questions you've decide, designed um, and the, the, the background, the demographics um, that you find out from your survey. For example, you might put down, you want their gender, you want their class um, based on class year, you want how they may consider themselves um, in a certain class level, and you might also, like middle class, um, working class, kind of how I had you describe yourself on your introduction. And then you might also put in there something like, um, are you from an urban setting? Did you grow up uh, in a suburb? Did you grow up in a small town? Any of that background can help in your research design. And then when you get your results, you could say, well, yeah, actually we see people from working class families put off uh, marriage or don't even think about marriage. Uh, when they were asked the question, are you considering marriage after college or are you in a relationship that could be a long-term result in marriage? Um, 
so those are things that you can can look at and then just interpret them. What did you find? You don't have to necessarily uh, defend them. It's all just what did you find? Then you report those research findings and then repeat is not what you'll do in this class, but if you ever wanted to continue that later on, that's what we do in our research process. I know that was a long time on that slide, but it hopefully is something I will ask a lot about this one in particular uh, on the quiz because I want you to know the different levels. We also look at variables just like any other science. A variable is a factor or trait or condition that can exist in differing amounts and types. And so we want you to be able to see a variable. Um, for example, um, I am studying foreign born pastors as they serve mostly white congregations in Nebraska and Kansas. The variables I'm looking at are both whether a, a person is foreign born or if they're native born and how it affects things like income of the church, attendance, and membership. Those are all variables, one affecting the other. And so you have to know how that effect is, uh, and it can be in reverse. For example, um, an independent variable is the one you have control over. Usually it's what you think will affect what you're studying. So my independent variable, most of the time, is gonna be whether the church had a foreign-born pastor or a native-born pastor that kind of can affect the dependent variable which is levels of income over a certain amount of time whether people choose to stay at the church and attend or whether or not that that uh, membership goes up or down that's the dependent variable so the cause of something now this is something that can sometimes happen whereas certain levels of churches that might have higher income that may have higher membership and higher attendance may not receive a foreign born pastor based on the system itself. So you can reverse that and say, uh, are there, does the level of uh, attendance affect whether or not the church experiences a foreign born pastor or native born pastor? Then you can throw in things that are called control variables. For example, when I look at foreign born pastors and native born pastors, how does gender affect that variable? When I'm looking at foreign born males versus foreign born females as they are compared to the whole group of pastors that I'm looking at, how does that affect income? Is it different if it's a person that is male, female? Is it different if it's a person that's from a different part of the world? So are African foreign born pastors doing better than South Korean foreign born pastors or Asian foreign born pastors. So that's how that works. When you're looking at your independent variable, you always wanna think of the one that you think is going to cause the effect that you're looking at, and then sometimes throw in a control, which is typically things that we call demographics, gender, class, age, class level in school, et cetera. Sometimes you can't get an idea of everybody in the group. So you get a proportional sampling of cases from a large population as representative of the population. And we're not gonna talk about sampling as much in this class, but if you take a statistics class or if you've taken any kind of class that has to do some sort of um, survey work and it's with large populations, what you typically do is a random sample um, there are random sample tables. There are things that you can use online that will produce that. So it might say take every 18th number of that list um, so that you are not biasing or putting a bias to your study. A representative sample is a sample that's statistically typical of that population. So what you might do is um, in some of our generated ones that are online, you can put in the idea of what the typical population is, and then it can kind of give you an idea of how to pick those samples. Ethnography is also important. It's participant observation, and you may choose to do this, where you study a social problem on campus and you go to the group that you think is being affected by that and observe it. A social scientist does field work and they'll take notes, they observe that community as they go about their lives, and they collect data through interviews and experiences. So for example, if you're looking at student loan debt again, and maybe you wanna see how Greek life or being involved in sports 
is something that might affect, you know, do they have more scholarships? Do they have less scholarships? Um, are there things that are in place that they have more connections to be able to help them have less debt? An ethnographer goes to explain the presence of what they're studying and why they're studying it with in-depth interviews typically. I wouldn't expect super in-depth interviews, but I often invite people to consider this because it's a lot of fun. It gives you an excuse to go see something differently and to be a scientist about it, not just somebody who's curious. Surveys, surveys, however, can feel a little more less invasive because you can conduct them in person, on mail, by uh, online, telephone, hand them out. Um, usually involves multiple choice or standardized answers. So for example, you've probably done many surveys where it's like on a scale of one to 10 or out of these answers, what seems most likely. That's typically what I expect in this class is at least some survey work uh, for your final project. And so um, we'll talk more in the middle of the semester about how to put together a really good survey. Experiments are also fun, um, but I have to know, especially if you're gonna do this for your final project, what kind of experiment. We have lots of um, human um, observation that needs to be okayed through school policy. And there typically needs to be some sort of idea of what that experiment may involve. For example, um, there have been people that have observed people in private settings and they may, uh, if, a, if a person doesn't know they're being observed and you're recording that material, not only does it feel sometimes like stalking, but it can actually cause some issues as far as legality. So if your professor knows that you're doing this work and we put it through, especially if it needs to go through uh, human services to where they're like, we're aware of this, um, people are gonna be studying people coming in and out of the bathroom, um, that kind of thing, you know, those types of areas are very sensitive. And so I have often said, you know, there's certain experiments, if you're looking at people in the library and, you know, trying to observe you know how many times they use um, the uh, computer or the desk or something like that for help that's different than if you are observing people uh, in intimate settings and trying to get some sort of data about that so just keep that in mind make to sure sure to look over page 30 in your text to understand statistical terms this is also important because we're dealing with humans and having informed consent is important if it is uh, something, for example, if you're taking a survey, um, usually that counts if people go ahead and take the survey as informed consent. However, if you're doing an interview, you need to have some sort of a date, uh, signature, and some sense of what you're using this for and that you would, will do the best to uh, keep the identity of the person um, as confidential as possible. So that's important. And then if you do an interview, often we have to do debriefing afterwards to kind of say, is this what we get? This is what we've learned from this study. Uh, and I wanted you to have a copy of it so you know what came out of that. Let's talk a little bit about theory. Um, I think that that's an important thing when we're um, understanding that um, theory is something that I'm sorry, I'm trying to get that out of the way a little bit. Um, a lot of people get scared about, <laughs> honestly. They, don't, they think, oh, it sounds so big. It sounds so um, out there and abstract. I often say, look at theory like it's a pair of lenses, and this isn't new. I've heard it from other uh, professors where you're putting on a pair of glasses to look at the world through this particular idea. And this idea is a theory that over time, if you observe it, you might say, yes, it fits with that theory. Um, it fits with this is how things are done. And this is all people are doing is putting an idea out there about how this uh, action or actions that are being done by humans is uh, working and operating. So functional, functionalism is probably the first theory that we hear about in any social science. Sometimes it's in psychology as well. Talcott Parsons and Robert K. Merton in the 50s were high active uh, 
sociologists and social scientists in the community uh, producing a lot of material on this, especially when it came to studying children and their development. Uh, they both introduced that function of activity as a way of gluing society together. And another person that uh, we need to look at who was the functionalist is um, Durkheim. Neil Durkheim uh, really came up with that phrase, what does glue society together? And the functions could be manifest functions, things that people say they are doing deliberately, or they can be latent functions, things that are kind of underlying everything. For example, we are taught to drive in the United States on the right side of the road. And that over time, when you're a child, you just get used to traveling that way in the back seat. Um, and then suddenly when you learn to drive, it's not something that um, intentionally really think about. You just kind of know that that's what you do. However, if you go to the UK and decide to drive, you'll find quickly that their manifest function of driving on the left side of the road and with your steering wheel on the other side of the car may produce uh, more intentionality. You may have to be more manifest about that function because it's not latent. It's not something that's been underlying um, in your background and so you have to learn something different. So again, manifest is intended function like going to school, becoming a doctor, something you're uh, going to do when you know you're doing it. Latent function is unintended function. It's higher social status that your friend who is a teacher um, than your friend who's a teacher. This is kind of stuff that society does underneath. Um, and so, so I often say we, we don't even really think about the latent function. But that's a lot of times what we study as sociolog sociologists is trying to get an idea of what's causing this and what are we not paying attention to. Marxism or conflict theory is uh, the study of class conflict and how power is shared. And often it's referred to as conflict theory because of the base of it is that there, Marx had this grand theory that all classes would be uh, at each other's throats, basically fighting over power for all of time. Well, um, some people think that that's something that's happened forever. However, capitalism really is where we saw the largest rise of difference in economy between people. Typically, most of the population pre-capitalism, sure, there were people that were kings and queens, but people often had same status levels um, as they worked in feudal systems. And in especially Western uh, ideology, uh, conf conflict theory played a major part in uh, looking after the French Revolution, especially at how those kings and queens, as they were turned over, those dukes, all that feudal system was turned over, those who became the owners and those who became the workers suddenly had a conflict over their role because profit and um, income was based on trying to create yourself into a certain class. Now, there are a lot of different folks who have studied this over time. Max Weber actually eventually studied this a little bit with um, the difference between Protestantism and um, Catholicism and how profit and that um, the spirit of the Protestant uh, ethic, work ethic made a difference on who became owners. Um, th these are types of things that Marx would basically say, we need to look at who has the power and who doesn't have the power. So conflict theory is often woven into uh, class studies, race and ethnicity studies, and obviously feminism, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And it, it gives the uh, sense that all of us don't start with the same amount of resources and that society has created that, and that especially in our particular systems, um, that is an expected latent function of what we do and that that is a conflict. And, and so conflict theory looks at that inequality as a, a problem and a major social problem. Feminism does the same thing, but it basically looks at it from the eyes of women and unequal power due to gender. Some people think that you know women have always been second class society and that may be true, although it's more true as we see the industrial world present itself. And of course, we don't have a ton of history that we can go back um, in our brains to think about, you know, what was it like to, to live in tribal times? And um, there's a lot of um, world history that 
uh, is focused on Western history. Um, what I intend to have people think about is um, our current status of, of how women are treated. Why, are, why is their uh, work life uh, valued less? And especially when you add in race, ethnicity, um, and when you actually add in even parts of the country or parts of the world, um, why, why is it that somebody who might do the same exact job, but because of their gender, are they receiving less? Um, do they have less power, less representation, even though we have more women in the world than we do men? Um, and that's an interesting context. So that's how feminism will look at it, is always through the eyes of how you can study society and its sense of equality and conflict based on how women are being treated. Postmodern theory is not just a one perspective, but like there are so many ways in which we can experience life. It's constantly in flux. And so there is no just conflict theory or feminism. There, all of these things, functionalism, feminism, Marxism, um, are part of a very plural world. And you have to understand how that society is seeing itself. And so it can mean lots of different things. People will say, you can't just explain one truth because there are many truths. And so people will often go with postmodernist theory to say, I'm going to use conflict theory to look at this society. However, I recognize that they may not see themselves in that light. Um, and a lot of times you start from the base of that society and say, this is their theory and I'm not going to try to put conflict theory, feminism or functionalism on that as a label. Symbolic interactionism is something that uh, George Herbert Mead um, emphasized, and there is a video on all of these theorists, so please take time to look at that. Um, I would like you to make sure to interact that with your posts this week. But it emphasizes the role of symbols and language as core elements of human interaction. In fact, everything is a stage. We're all part of a world that is made up symbolically, but differently based on our culture and our background. And so our symbols may mean different things. For example, I talk about countries and their flags. Certain things, you may have a sense of patriotism with each flag, but you may also have a different understanding of what that flag represents as a culture. Each culture may not think about the flag in the same way of their nation state. In fact, some people might have a negative reaction to it and some may have positive reaction to it. We're seeing that a lot with the kneeling uh, debate right now. Some people may have lots of uh, more pluralistic idea of it. It's like, it is both positive and negative, um, but there's symbol in involved. And you know, we know it's a, a piece of material. If you look at the, the actual flags, they are made out of material. They have some sort of symbolic meaning. There's usually something that says something about the color and why it was chosen. Um, what are the, the actual uh, symbols that are being used? Stars, moons, um, fleur de lis. These are different things that show up. So symbolic interactionism says we create that symbol and it is the belief in that that people um, are defending a lot of the time. I uh, thank you for uh, listening today and um, hope that you have a really good week. Hopefully it makes a little more sense on the method and a little bit more sense on uh, the theories. Um, I will quickly remind you if you have any questions, my uh, cell phone is 913-553-0267. I um, would love for you to text if you have any questions and I'll look forward to seeing your post this week. Have a great rest of the week.